Good morning, everybody. Welcome to another edition of Lab 207 Webcast. My name is Mr. Kite, and I'll be hanging out with you today as we continue on in our series about ecology. Topic for the day is going to be biogeochemical cycles. So by the end of the day, here are the things that I need you to know or be able to do. The first one is to understand the necessity of nutrient cycling, and the second is to compare and contrast the four major biogeochemical cycles. So that's what we've got today. Let's go ahead and get on into it. I'm going to start out by talking about the process of recycling. I'm not talking about going green. I'm not talking about turning in your cans. I'm talking about elements. Um, if you think back to the laws of thermodynamics we talked about, we said the first law is that energy can neither be created nor destroyed. Matter is the same way. All of the elements that we presently have on the Earth are pretty much what we've had since the beginning of time. The only input that we've had from outside the Earth would be the occasional meteorite that hits the Earth. But other than that, all of the elements that are here have been here since life began. So obviously things have to cycle if we're going to keep things alive. So the carbon that's part of you could have been the carbon that was a part of a dinosaur 65 million years ago. Um, but keep this idea of recycling in mind as we go forward because it's necessary to life. And all of this cycling and basically the major topic for the rest of this video is going to be biogeochemical cycles. And Seems like a big word. Let's break it down a little bit. Bio is going to be living. Geo is going to refer to the earth. And you got chemicals in there. So what we're going to talk about for the next few slides is going to be the way that inorganic elements such as phosphorus, nitrogen, um, water obviously isn't an element, but water. And then we're also going to talk about carbon. We're going to talk about the way those things move between the abiotic and biotic components of an ecosystem. And it is a continuous flow that goes all the way around. So I guess without further ado or too many more words, I'm going to jump in. We're going to go through the water cycle, carbon cycle, nitrogen cycle, and phosphorus cycle, and then have a couple of tie-up slides at the end to bring it all together. So first cycle is the water cycle. This is one that I am sure you probably learned about way back in middle school, but I want to remind you of it just because it's important to be aware of. Um, in terms of reservoirs, throughout this video, reservoirs, anything that is going to be storing whatever element we're talking about, major reservoirs of water are going to be the ocean. 97% of water on Earth is in the ocean. 2% is locked up in ice and glaciers. And you've got 1% that is in lakes, streams, and available for drinking. So three major processes with the water cycle are as follows. We start out with some body of water. In this case, we're going to say the ocean. You get evaporation that sends that water up into the atmosphere. Once it's into the atmosphere, it condenses into nice fluffy clouds. That would be condensation. And then... After it has condensed, at some point, it is going to go through precipitation where it falls as rain or snow. It is then going to be transported. If it's snow, it's going to melt and run off into streams that will run off into lakes, and then it'll you know, evaporate back into the atmosphere. Some of it can infiltrate the ground where it will become groundwater, and it will move underground to some surface water source. But either way, it's going to get back to a surface water source, and then it's going to go through the process all over again. So no new water on Earth. It is all the water that has been here, and it's just been moving through this process of evaporation, condensation, and precipitation since the beginning of time. Next cycle that we're going to talk about is going to be the carbon cycle. The reason the carbon cycle is important to us is because carbon is the framework for all organic molecules. Without carbon, we would not exist. And we've got the screen here divided up into two sections. We've got like terrestrial carbon cycling and we've got um, oceanic carbon cycling. Essentially what you get is all carbon cycling starts out right here with carbon fixation. This would be plants or photosynthetic organisms taking CO2 out of the atmosphere and turning it into organic material in the form of carbohydrates. Those carbohydrates can then generally be consumed by some organism. In that case, it is going to be eaten. The organism that eats that carbon is going to do one of two things. Either exhale it immediately back to the atmosphere, or it will become part of them. And when they die, that carbon will decompose into the soil, at which point it might be broken down by microbes, which will breathe it out back into the atmosphere, or some of it may be stored as fossil carbon, which we know as fossil fuels. That's all decomposed organic material from a long time ago. In the ocean, you get a lot of carbon cycling into the ocean. So 
the oceans can directly absorb carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. Um, that gaseous carbon dioxide that is absorbed can be released directly back to the atmosphere. You also have got organisms living in the ocean that go through respiration and decomposition, which also releases their carbon dioxide back to the ocean or back to the atmosphere. And you get some carbon that is stored in the form of ocean sediment. So those would be major reservoirs of carbon. So this here is carbon cycle. Um, one way that we disrupt the carbon cycle would be through the burning of fossil fuels. This system is the system that the Earth intended. And as the Earth intended it, fossil carbon was supposed to stay trapped underground. Problem is, humans like to dig up fossil carbon, burn it in our cars and factories, and that releases carbon that would have stayed underground back into the atmosphere. So the cycle is designed to run off of what's in the atmosphere and leave some stuff stored underground. We have disrupted that cycle by pulling the stuff from underground up above ground and burning it, putting it back into the system. Next up on the hit parade is going to be the nitrogen cycle. Now, nitrogen cycle is important because <clears throat> nitrogen is essential, well, I guess it's important to people and living organisms because nitrogen is essential for the formation of amino acids and proteins and without those two things we would not be alive. The major point that I want you to remember about the nitrogen cycle is that it relies on fixation from bacteria or at least naturally it does. Um, the atmosphere that we breathe on a day-to-day -day basis is 80 percent nitrogen, 78 percent but that nitrogen is absolutely useless to us. The nitrogen you breathe in all day has no bearing on the proteins and amino acids in your body. It doesn't do any good for you. So what you get going on, at least in the natural world, is you've got bacteria called nitrogen-fixing bacteria. Those nitrogen-fixing bacteria take, bacteria take nitrogen out of the atmosphere. They turn it into ammonium or nitrate. Once it's turned into ammonium or nitrate, plants are able to take it up. The plants then take that nitrogen up into their tissues. We eat the tissues and we get the nitrogen. So without those bacteria to turn the nitrogen into a form that plants can uptake, we wouldn't be able to get any useful nitrogen out of the atmosphere, which means we wouldn't have proteins and amino acids. Now, Back in, I believe it was the 40s, humans decided, or not decided, but learned essentially how to take nitrogen out of the atmosphere and turn it into fertilizer because in a lot of terrestrial ecosystems, nitrogen is a limiting element. So if you don't have nitrogen, you can't grow plants. However, if you get lots of nitrogen, you can grow plants beautifully. So humans started to disrupt this cycle a bit when we learned how to make nitrogen containing fertilizers, which we put onto our crops. Obviously, they take in that nitrogen. We eat it and we get the nitrogen. Um, I read or heard something somewhere that said that essentially 50% of the nitrogen in our bodies comes from fertilizers that were made by humans pulling nitrogen out of the atmosphere. So nitrogen cycle naturally relies on bacteria to fix that nitrogen and make it useful to us. Um, as far as the return trip goes, anything that has uh, nitrogen in its tissues, when it dies and decomposes, that nitrogen goes back into the soil and there are decomposers that denitrify the material which essentially means that they break down the nitrogen that's held in the tissue and release it back to the atmosphere as nitrogen containing gas and some of it goes into the soil. Last cycle for the day is going to be the phosphorus cycle. The one thing that I want you to remember about the phosphorus cycle is that it is the only of the four cycles that we're talking about where the element in question does not exist in a gaseous state. So this does not deal with the atmosphere. Most of the phosphorus that we are worried about is contained in rocks and minerals on the earth. And basically what you get is we start out with the phosphorus stored in rocks as those rocks are weathered and decomposed, the phosphorus is released. Once it is released, plants and animals are free to take it up. Obviously, plants take it up first out of the uh, soil, then animals eat those plants and get the phosphorus. When those animals die, they decompose and the phosphorus makes it back into the soil, which eventually will be converted into sedimentary rock, uplifted, and the cycle starts all over again. Reason we care about phosphorus is because we've got adenosine triphosphate, so no ATP without phosphorus, no phospholipid bilayer for our cell membranes without phosphorus. So 
it's a big deal. Of the cycles, it is the slowest of the cycles because it depends on this weathering and reformation of rock. And one way that humans disrupt it is through the use of industrial fertilizers also. A lot of fertilizers contain phosphorus, so by adding phosphorus into uh, gardens or farms or something like that, we are introducing extra phosphorus to the cycle that normally would not be there. Two slides to wrap up. This whole biogeochemical cycling thing depends on decomposition. Um, if there were not decomposers around, the nutrients that are trapped in living tissue could not be released back to the earth to go back into the cycle. So we depend on all of those organisms that break down bodies and plants and organisms to release those nutrients back into the cycle. And one living, living laboratory of natural cycling is a place called Hubbard Brook. Um, it's a series of six valleys that researchers have been using since the 60s to study biogeochemical cycling. And essentially what it is, is each of these valleys has one stream that drains it. So they have set up stations that measure all input into the system in the form of rain and water. Um, and the output, they just built these dams, like you can see right there at the end of each stream, and they can measure how much water and nutrients is being flushed out of the system. So it's a nice, clean, neat little thing. Um, over time, they have realized that most biogeochemical cycling happens locally. So the minerals and nutrients that fall on an ecosystem generally stay in cycle within that ecosystem. Um, they also have found out that deforestation plays a huge role in uh, nutrient cycling. They took one of their valleys, they completely deforested it, and then they compared it to the forested valleys, and they found that the water output was something like four times greater, so a lot more water was flowing out. Maybe it was higher than that. They found that a lot more water was flowing out of the system than others, so they realized that, hey, plants and trees are needed to take up that water so it doesn't rush out as quickly. They also found that the water coming out of that ecosystem had a very high concentration of nitrates in it, which means that in a normal, happy, functioning system, the plants are there to pull out the nitrates, but this deforested system had so much nitrate in the water that it was actually unsafe for human consumption. So quite a significant finding about the role of plants in nutrient cycling. And that's it. I hope this gave you a little better insight into the biogeochemical cycles and the way that things recycle through the atmosphere. Sorry for any background noise. They're doing the floors. Thanks for joining us on the Lab 207 webcast. My name is Mr. Kite, and we'll see you again.